Now that we have all our data in place, we can look at the design for the first screen. This is going to be a grid of all the missions next to their mission badges. Now earlier in our asset catalog, we added pictures named uh, Apollo 1, Apollo 7, Apollo 10, up to Apollo 17, each at 2x and 3x. And our mission struct includes an ID number here. And so we can use string interpolation to get Apollo mission ID to have Apollo 1, Apollo 2, and Apollo 3, and so forth. And then Apollo space mission ID to have it spaced nicely for user facing data. So without the space, to refer to our asset catalog items here, and with the space to refer to our uh, user facing text. But we'll take a different approach to using that directly in our views because we're going to use this in other places too. We're going to add some computed properties here to our mission struct that will send back that same data. The result will be identical. Apollo 1, Apollo 2, Apollo 10, and so forth. But now the code's in one place, the mission struct, which means any other views can use the same strings, neatly formatted, same pictures, and so forth, without having to repeat the string interpolation again and again and again. And in turn means, if we change the way our files are formatted in the future, maybe Apollo-1 for the image names, for example, we're going to change lots of places in our code, just do it in one place and it'll all work. And so, inside the mission struct, I'd like to say there's a new property called display name, a string, which is Apollo space string interpolation ID, capital A. And then for the image, this is image string. This will just send back immediately Apollo ID, lowercase a, no space these times. Now with these two in place, we can take our first pass at filling in content view. This will have a navigation view at the top, a lazy V grid with all our mission data using all the missions we loaded already. There'll be a navigation link inside there that'll push to a new string. We'll add uh, the image for the badge, the name, and the launch date all at once here. Uh, there is one small complexity, which if you remember, is this launch date here is an optional string. So we've got to use nil coalescing to make sure there's a value for the text view if the launch date is missing. First things first, it's a grid. So we'll say in content view, we'll start by adding our column definition. So we'll say, uh, let columns be an array of one column, which is a grid item, using the adaptive layout, minimum 150, maximum, no maximum, it can be as big as it wants. That's our uh, grid layout, nice and simple. But adaptive means it will squeeze in as many rows as it can to fit the available space. Many items as it can, even columns, that's the one. Um, in our body, we'll say there is a navigation view. Inside there will be a scroll view. These are vertical by default. Then we'll add a lazy V grid, a vertically scrolling uh, grid now, with columns of our columns, like that. And inside here, that's where we have our for each placing all our missions. So we'll say there's a for each over missions with a mission coming in. This thing will link to ultimately a detailed view with more information, but for now, we'll do a simple navigation link pointing to text of detail view. We'll fix that one later on. But we can add a label, the thing inside the thing, the thing inside the navigation link will be a V stack of data showing an image of our missions image. So Apollo one and similar. As you can see, it's quite big by default. So we'll say actually it should be resizable <laughs> and scale to fit. And I'll give an exact frame with a width of 100 and a height of 100. That should make it look better. There we go. Uh, then inside the VStack, so a VStack inside the VStack, we'll say that is our uh, mission dot display name. I'll use a font of headline for that. Like that. And below that, we'll do a text of our mission launch date. Now, this remember is an optional string, so we've got to do nil coalescing. NA did not launch, sadly, in a font of caption. Now, the inner V stack, I'm going to say, grow as big as you need to. Take as much space as you can, given the constraints of our grid, by saying frame has a max width of infinity. 
at the very end of our scroll view, so down here, we'll add a navigation title of Moonshot. Okay. I know it looks pretty ugly. That's fine, we're gonna fix it up in just a moment. First though, let's focus on what we have so far. I'll press Command R to run our code in the simulator so you can see it all working nicely. Uh, we should have this vertically scrolling list of all, uh, well not 17, but we have uh, obviously minus two through six, how many Apollo missions here, working nicely with the title at the top and so forth. It looks okay to start with, right? Uh, the images, as I said, are, are scaled down and scaled to fit into that 100 by 100 area, but they maintain the aspect ratio. This one here looks squashed. It was designed that way. Uh, oh, is that Apollo 14, I guess? Um, it was designed to be squashed, so it's not our code, it's just a different shape. Anyway, apart from the scrappy layout, there's another problem that kind of isn't, isn't great, which is the dates. Um, you can see they are in the form 1968-12-21. And yeah, we can understand that happens to mean the 21st December uh, 1968. But it's still an a natural date format for almost everyone. I think Japan uses it maybe, a couple of other countries, but it's, it's really not very common. We can do better than this. Because Swift's JSON decoder has a property to determine the date decoding strategy. How it should decode dates that it finds. And we can provide this thing with a special type called date formatter that will understand how to format dates. This works in a very, very precise way, extraordinarily precise. And it might even confuse you the first time you see it. Uh, it's, it is Y-MM-DD, and it needs to be capital M as well, lowercase Y, lowercase D. It's very precise for historical reasons. What it means is we've got a year, then a dash, then a zero padded month, then a dash, then a zero padded day. We're telling exactly what to look for. That's what we have here. Zero padded means when it's five, it's not just five by itself, but it's zero five. So Swift needs to know exactly how the way our date looks in our data in order to format it correctly, to read it correctly. And so I would open bundle decodable.swift and after we make the decoder, add this. Let formatter is a new date formatter. Formatter.date format is y-mm-dd, like that. It is case sensitive. You need to have mm in capital letters. If you have it in lowercase, it means a zero padded minute, which is not what you want. You want zero padded month, like that. So. That's the format we have in our code, in our JSON file right now. We want to use that when we decode our JSON, and we can say uh, decoder.date decoding strategy. And be careful, because it is also a data decoding strategy. You want date decoding strategy. And that will be dot formatted using our formatter. So all we're doing is telling Swift, when you find dates, they will be in this exact format. Please read them in so we can work with them as real dates rather than as text strings. Now, a tip for you in your own code, when you're working with dates like this, it's often a very good idea to be specific about the time zone you are working with. Uh, if you actually say formatter.timezone, you can provide a custom time zone here, and you will generally want to, because if you don't, the user's own time zone will be shown uh, will be used to parse the, the, the text. Now, in, in our case, we're parsing it in user's time zone and displaying it in their time zone, so it's not a problem. But in your own code, you might have data from the internet or somewhere else in a different time zone. Be specific nearly all the time, it's a good idea. Here is no problem, but in your own code, there might be, so be careful with that. Now, if you run the code again with our new date decoding strategy in place, it is going to look exactly the same. Nothing has changed at all. And that makes sense because we've told Swift how to decode dates, but it doesn't really realize that these are dates. We've told it in our mission Swift file, they're actually optional strings, not dates. If we want it to be a date, make it an optional date. And now, 
Swift will look at the string, think, hmm, this should be a date, use our date decoding strategy, YMMDD, to make it into a real date. But now, at the same time, our code won't compile anymore um, because we're trying to show a date in here. And SwiftUI is like, well, how do I show a date in there? It makes no sense. Uh, and so we still have this code in here to show an optional string or nil coalesce to NA if we can. We've got to take that out and instead show a date formatted somehow. I think this is a great place again where a computed property works very, very well. We can ask the mission itself in uh, mission.swift here to get the date, convert it to an optional, uh, a, a displayable string somehow, or send back NA as needed. Um, and this is going to use the same formatted method you've used previously for formatting dates um, plus uh, nil crescent to NA. So we'll say there's a new property called var formatted launch date is a string. This will send back launch date dot formatted with the date being abbreviated and the time being omitted. Nil coalescing to N A like that. And now with that in place, we can go back to our content view and replace this whole nil coalescing part with just mission.formatted launch date. And now our dates should be rendered better, a much more natural way. I'll press Command R and you should see it for yourself, all being well. There we go. So Oct 11, 1968 and similar. Even better, it'll be rendered in whatever is the correct region appropriate way for the user. So what you see might not be the same as what I see, depending on your region settings right now. Now let's focus on the bigger problem, our layout's pretty dull, right? It's a pretty grim layout. To spruce up a little bit, I wanna introduce you to two useful features. Firstly, how to share custom colors everywhere in your app easily. And second, how to force a dark theme for the app. First up, colors. There are two ways of doing this, making like a color theme for your app, and both are useful. First up, you can, if you want to, add colors to your asset catalog. There's one up here, accent color. You can provide a color in there if you want to. The other option is to make an extension to store them. They both have their advantages. You know, the asset catalog lets you work visually. You can literally drag slides around to find the exact color you want, but using code makes it easier to monitor changes using something like GitHub you can see the code coming and going versus an asset catalog, which is hard to understand. Now, I'm not a big fan of the way asset catalogs require us to use strings for color names, just like images are image, my image in quotes. So we're gonna use the alternative approach, which means placing our color names into Swift as extensions. Now, we want to add new colors, so we could make an extension on the color struct, but Swift gives us a better option with only a little bit more work. Because color, the type, the view type, conforms to a bigger protocol called shape style. And that lets us use colors, gradients, materials, and more as if they were the same thing. We can say background ultra thin material, background dot red, background linear gradient, and they all work because they're all shape styles. Now this shape style protocol is what background uses. It's gotta be given some kind of shape style. So what we really want to do is extend color but do so in a way that all modifiers in SwiftUI using shape style also work. And this can be done with a very precise extension that pretty much literally says we want to extend all of shape style, but only for times when it's being used as a color. That's what I'm saying. So let's try this out, make a new Swift file. And I'll call this color-theme because extension on color, adding our theme stuff, and give it this code here. There's an extension on shape style, but only if we are extending colors. And we'll add static var dark background, a color, is color with red 0.1, green 0.1, blue 0.2. Then static var light background is color, color red 0.2, green 0.2, blue 0.3. So adding two new colors here, light background and dark background 
each with precise values of red, green, and blue. But more importantly, we place those inside a very specific extension that allows us to use these colors everywhere SwiftUI expects a shape style to be given. And I'm gonna put these things into action immediately in content view. First, here's our VStack containing the mission details and the name and the launch date. It already has this max width infinity thing here and you'll see exactly why now. We're gonna modify slightly. I'll say um, before the frame, I wanna add a little bit of padding vertically, then have our frame size and then finally add a background of light background. And you'll see it in our preview in a second all being well. Let's find out. Boom. Hard to read, don't worry, we're still working on it. Next, I wanna mo modify the outer V stack here. The one that's a whole label for our navigation view. Um, I want this to look more like a box inside our grid. And that means drawing a line around it and then clipping the shape just a little bit. So to get this effect, I wanna add some modifiers to the V stack. We'll say it has a clip shape of rounded rectangle, corner radius 10. Clip the edges and you'll see it clip the bottom of our little blue thing here. But then we'll say it has an overlay. So we can do a nice stroke on this here. And we'll say that it has an overlay of rounded rectangle, again, corner radius 10, with a stroke of dot light background. So we'll draw a nice curved stroke around the boxes we have. Third, I want to add a little bit of padding just to get things away from the edges a little bit. That means first adding some padding to the, the mission image after the frame, just saying padding like that. Push away from the edges a little bit. And then adding some horizontal and bottom padding to our grid. So find your grid here, find the end of it, and then say there's padding uh, with dot horizontal and dot bottom like that. Now it's really important you add this padding to the grid, not to the scroll view inside that contains the grid. Because if you pad the scroll view, the scroll bars get pushed in as well. It looks very, very strange on the screen. You want to pad the thing inside the scroll view and keep the scroll view itself going edge to edge. And now we can replace our white background with the custom background we added earlier. So we have our now title here. After that say, background of dark background. And the whole thing should look like that. Now at this point, our layout almost done. But to finish up, we're gonna look at the remaining colors we have, a sort of light blue navigation color for our text, plus this title, Moonshot's still up there, but it's basically invisible. It's a dark blue background with a black title. We can fix up each of these things fairly quickly. We can say that our uh, display name here has the foreground color of white. So should pop in white, hoping well, there we go. And our launch date will be foreground color dot white dot opacity 0.5. So not pure white, slightly grayish, but not gray because it's slightly translucent. So we're instead seeing a little bit of that bluish background come through. As for the moonshot title, this thing is made up there. You can barely see it. It's made by a navigation view and it'll appear either black or white depending on whether you're using light mode or dark mode. So if I run the app back now, you'll see what I mean. The whole thing changes if you're in light mode or dark mode. So I'm in light mode right now, so I've got black text, and when I scroll up, I get this sort of light bar. And in dark mode, I get white text, as you'd expect, and then a nice black bar. To fix this, we can tell SwiftUI our view prefers to be in dark mode always. And it'll cause a title and navigation bar to look like that no matter what. We get a dark mode theme all the way through, which of course is extra pro. And to do that, we already have uh, our uh, nav view and scroll view. We're gonna say to our scroll view, you prefer to be in dark mode across the board, everywhere. So we'll say there is a preferred color scheme of dark. And now no matter what appearance you're in, light or dark mode, you'll have the same effect. By the way, it is a, a shift command A 
to change light mode and dark mode. That's a, the shortcut I'm using on my screen. So that's light mode and that's dark mode. It's the same thing both ways. If I go to the home screen, you'll perhaps see it better. So that's a uh, light mode, that's dark mode. It is, it is changing, but in the app itself, it is not changing anymore because it's the same either way. Our view expects to be in dark mode no matter what. And we'll look that way too. So at this point we have a beautifully scrolling grid of missions. It'll smoothly adapt to every screen size you have, including things like landscape mode by adding more grid columns. We have this bright white navigation text, plus a nice dark background, uh, color the blues going on. We have a, a dark nav bar at the top with the white text no matter what. And tapping any of these things will show you the next screen. In this case, just detail view. This is a really great start.